so we, we are recording <laughs> so i hope that's fine for everyone sorry i was um i didn't see that coming as quickly no so the the, the choice of when we are meeting is not by coincidence we are now in the middle of the 16 days campaign of act again activism against gbv uh the 16 days start on the November 25th, which is the day, international day to eliminate all forms of violence against women. Um, that day be became recognized as with that international um, clout in a way uh, in Bogota, in Colombia, where Latin American feminist uh, movement joined together commemorating the day of the, uh, where the three uh, Mirabal sisters were assassinated in the Dominican Republic. And then, so we start on the 25th of November, and then we go all the way to the um, International Day for Human Rights on the 10th of December. So now we're in the middle of that period. And this is a period where in all the countries, uh, our subclusters and all the partners are, are creating awareness and, and doing campaigns around the, the need for collective responsibility to end GBV. And as part of the campaign, the global clusters came together this year with a statement as well around how global clusters have a role to play to ensure that we do re mitigate risk, that we do reduce harm that could be provoked by our programming, and that whatever cluster, we all have a responsibility to, to play to make sure that GBV is understood and prioritized ac across the response. Um, I'm here today just to moderate. My name is Astrid Holland, and I work for the GBVAUR. Um, and I'd like to introduce our panelists who will come one after the other in alphabetical order. So first we have Ella Sedaroglu from IFRC, IFRC, who is the Global Shelter Cluster Co-Lead. Then we will have Linda Dull, who is the Global Health Cluster Coordinator with WHO. Then Monica Ramos from UNICEF, who is the global coordinator for the WASH cluster. And finally, but not the least, one who is the lead of the CCCM cluster. So be just before we go into the event, maybe, please feel free to put any uh, questions you have in the chat. Um, we will start off with a session where the panelists will be able to uh, share what the, what is being done and, and, and the progress in each sector around GBV risk mitigation. And then there will be a, a second half where we will be able to have a more informal discussion. Um, when I hope that you will bring your questions and, and that that will be a lively discussion before we end. We have one hour. So without any further ado, I'm going to, uh, let's start the, the panel. So the question that, uh, we'd like to ask everyone is how are you mitigating risks of GBV within your sector and why is it a collective responsibility and I'll be handing over first to Ella to speak on behalf of the Global Shelter Cluster. Thank you very much uh, Astrid and uh, to uh, my co-panelists of course for making the time to be here and uh, to all the 73 participants uh, who have chosen to be here uh, at this uh, hour today instead of being somewhere else. Uh, so uh, we're very happy with the participation. So I think um, um, I will start maybe um, with the second part of uh, Astrid's uh, question, why, um, why we think, why I think it's a collective responsibility um, and why we should be uh, um, taking action uh, together. Uh, of course, we all know, working in the humanitarian sector, that mainstreaming GBV mitigation is a requirement uh, across all sectors as part of accountable humanita humanitarian action. However, there is um, one word in that uh, sentence that uh, bothers me a little bit, and uh, it's the word requirement. I think we should not be doing it uh, because uh, it's the requirement, but I think um, GBV is something that has to disappear from our vocabulary and the reality. So the 25th of November as a day um, should actually disappear from the calendars uh, when uh, we're all able to take uh, collective action together as something that requires uh, the world's attention um, in the long run. Maybe we could strive uh, towards that. It is, of course, our collective responsibility and uh, that we should all do our part as sectors 
as humanitarians and also as individual human beings, just simply uh, um, as just uh, uh, human beings, uh, we should also take uh, action. The challenges the world um, throws at us at the moment are obviously uh, just they're getting um, bigger and more complex by the day. Uh, sometimes uh, it can even feel a bit uh, overwhelming. And there is not a single stakeholder, uh, I think, that who can take um, single handedly any meaningful action uh, um, or la make a lasting difference against adversaries as climate change unplanned urbanization, unprecedented levels of displacement, and of course, uh, GBV and, and so forth. What um, maybe it gives a little bit of hope uh, to us is that uh, we live in this age of uh, collaboration and co-creation and co-ownership. Um, and I think in tackling GBV, we, we also need to be really more than um, the sum of uh, uh, all our parts. And uh, as such, I'm actually really heartened um, and um, humbled uh, to be sitting here today. Juan was saying when we were just um, uh, connected before the session that we should have done it before. Yes, but I'm already happy that we're doing it now. And I know that today in this session, we will maybe mostly be talking about what our sectors are doing. And I hope next time when we come together, we can talk more about what we're doing all together jointly. Uh, so that would be uh, my wish. Um, and with that, I will come to the first part of your uh, question. So what are we doing um, in the shelter sector, more specifically within the uh, folds of the shelter cluster? Because obviously our partners are also doing a lot of work individually in their agencies. Um, and um, I will try to give an overview of that for the participants uh, who are joining us uh, from other sectors. Of course, in the shelter sector, we're very aware that uh, the GBV risks could be uh, reduced through appropriate uh, shelter programming. And we can enable mitigation um, interventions that are life-saving, um, even uh, through our design, through um, how the shelters are constructed and how they are um, laid out. Uh, inadequate housing, lack of um, housing, land of property rights, lack of safe shelter, as well as poor uh, camp and the wash facility designs could uh, are known, um, not could, they do uh, contribute um, um, to the GBV uh, risks. I also have to say that sometimes some of these uh, um, uh, considerations manifest themselves in quite unexpected ways uh, that could be counterintuitive to a design, how a design or a built environment professional um, thinks and is trained to, uh, to think. Um, I'm sure there are uh, colleagues in the um, I know that there are colleagues on the panel, but also colleagues in the um, audience who would be who were probably involved in the Haiti response. And uh, uh, you'll probably remember that uh, there was a requirement at some point that uh, all the uh, transitional shelters had to have two doors. And uh, when you just consider how small it was and uh, cost uh, and construction um, complications of making two doors, it just didn't feel for us as shelter professionals, uh, the very logical choice to do uh, two doors. But then the communities were so adamant in this uh, request that they really needed to have another back door to escape uh, in case of a, um, um, assault or uh, in case, I mean, it could also be of course crime related. They, women really um, asked us to have that second door that we had to change all the designs and, and put that in. Normally, it would not have been like on the top priority of, uh, of a shelter professional to design uh, with uh, two doors. But uh, that's what I mean, that sometimes we really have to uh, listen uh, very carefully and, and do it. And we always have to listen carefully, but uh, it can be sometimes really counterintuitive, but it can save lives, uh, of course. So with this in mind, uh, with these considerations in mind, I want to share a little bit, of, a small uh, overview of what the shelter cluster uh, has been looking at um, to do our part. First of all, I'm uh, quite happy um, to say that uh, in our global support team, we have a position uh, for GBV focal point that we uh, happily share with uh, our colleagues from the CCCM uh, cluster. Um, at the moment, the position is, the, is vacant and under recruitment, but very soon we're um, hoping to replace um, our focal point. 
And what uh, does this focal point do as a service provision to our country clusters? So um, he or she analyzes annually uh, all the HNOs and HRP shelter chapters to provide recommendations um, to country level clusters on how to mainstream uh, GBV uh, risk mitigation <laughs> actions. Um, secondly, um, um, the focal point provides technical support to our country clusters, and I know some of them are uh, in the audience. Maybe they can give um, some examples of how it has been beneficial uh, for them. Um, and um, they, they help them to develop a GBV risk mitigation matrix. So we're really trying to bring it down to the uh, level of the country clusters where uh, effective and meaningful action uh, can be taken. In addition to that, um, we have quite a number of uh, tools and products at the uh, service of um, shelter professionals, shelter partners, and country clusters. I think I will not go into the details uh, of all of them, but hopefully in the end, we can share maybe with the participants the full list and the links. Um, so they range from post distribution monitoring to all sorts of guidance around site planning, NFI distributions, um, case studies. We have this thing called constant companion, something really small that you can carry in your pocket at all times. And that really brings uh, us down to the basics um, of uh, how we can uh, incorporate considerations of GBV in shelter programming. And of course, um, we have also a number of uh, non-cluster um, related products that we are happy to um, promote because they really um, hit the nail uh, on the head. And um, as such, uh, we're also trying to um, collaborate as much as we can with the other sectors. We have one advantage, of course, uh, shelter and settlements uh, programming requires us to collaborate with other sectors um, by nature. Um, but uh, specifically with uh, colleagues from CCCM um, and uh, health and protection and WASH, we're really uh, trying to get it in everyone's uh, programming DNA um, to uh, collaborate and to design safe um, shelters, spaces, health facilities and WASH facilities for um, women and girls. Um, I think we will have the opportunity to discuss a little bit more and um, with that, I will hand over, but uh, very much looking to have the questions now, but also um, after the session, I think maybe people might need some time to think about some connections uh, with their work as well. So very happy to uh, be available also uh, in the coming days. Thank you, Astrid, I will hand over. Thank you, Ella. And I think we will wait with the questions because I'm sure there will be many, but uh, now handing over to uh, Monica Ramos from the Global Wash Cluster. Great. Thanks, colleagues, and thanks so much um, for having us here today. So really just kind of looking at uh, why. I think that's a really important part of the question, and maybe we can go to the next slide. Um, what we're really looking at is the collective responsibility, like many other clusters and sectors, in terms of recognizing that the risk of GBV does increase in emergencies. Mm -hmm. So really it is our collective responsibility to take action and to prevent and mitigate those risks. And as said by the colleagues from the shelter cluster, that is not something that one cluster or one sector can do alone. So we really need to work together. And I think that that's what's so great about the theme of today's webinar is I think it's, it's very much in that theme that we've come together. Um, really also recognizing that it takes direct action and, and actually collective on the collective responsibility to ensure that GBV is addressed in the earliest phases of the emergency. Um, knowing that women and girls have specific risks, they also have needs and particular coping mechanisms. And of course, any of that engagement um, really needs to look at how we empower women and girls and really build their resilience. Um, and if it's not done right, it actually can increase the risk of GBV. And particularly in WASH, what we see a lot of times is that women and girls do play the critical role in ensuring access to water or to sanitation facility, sanitation facilities, or even ensuring the basic hygiene of their family. And at times, because of this role, um, whether it be at home or in their communities, that really does increase the risk. And I think that's something that we, we need to take into account. And I, I think the example of the design is something that speaks very much to the wash uh, sector is also where we, how we design facilities, where we locate those facilities, and to really be thinking about that at the outset. Um, and another point that I think really is important is that GBV is rooted in gender 
um, inequality and that it can happen anywhere. And so it's something that I think we need to keep in mind and make sure that we are actually working towards um, mitigation of that risk and really looking at how we can provide support together. So for example, from our point of view, what we really focus on is to ensure protection from sexual exploitation and abuse. So it's an area that um, we really want to be focusing on um, both ourselves as a cluster, but with those uh, partners that we're working with. We also recognize that everybody does have a role to play in terms of linking survivors to services, um, really looking at how that can be done in a non-judgmental and confidential way and how we're able to support that through our work. And for us really uh, around this thing is that it is just really good WASH programming. I think it's getting back to the basics of really ensuring that facilities are safe and appropriate for women and girls of all ages, um, including those that are living with disabilities, and also making sure that more generally, the different uh, services that we are providing do meet the needs of the different population groups that we are um, assisting in effective communities. So it's really essential for us that the investment that we're making uh, in the WASH sector and through the coordination um, of partners working in the WASH sector, particularly in emergency settings, that safety is at the top and foremost of our collective responsibility and that we're really thinking about how our work can uh, be appropriate for the needs of those that we are serving. Um, maybe just in terms of the mitigating uh, bits in terms of what are we doing in coordination and response. So we have a, a few work streams ongoing in this area, and it really centers on how we engage and how we participate. So one of the first is really our five commitments. The GWC established um, several years ago, five commitments for safety and dignity, dignity for all affected populations. They're very simple, but yet they're very powerful. And it's something that we work with all of our coordination teams to also cascade down to the partnership. And it's really looking at listening and supporting and prioritizing the needs of the most vulnerable. It's also really looking at the access, monitoring the access and the barriers to services, particularly for women and girls, and also to then facilitate safety um, around usage of those facilities, as well as appropriate feedback channels. So again, when I said earlier that for us, GBV risk mitigation really uh, equals good WASH programming, I think that gives the example of where we're really trying to push forward the minimum commitments as the basic um, parameters around good WASH programming to ensure that affected communities are receiving the services uh, that are needed. We're also really looking at the area of accountability. And so we have launched a accountability and quality assurance uh, piece of work that we work with some of the partners on to collect and analyze data on safety uh, perceptions around the WASH response and really trying to look at um, how right now in the 10 countries that it's being piloted, how partners are coming together with the coordination platform to collect and analyze that information and really inform the response. So again, it's also bringing in the aspect of increased engagement and participation, particularly from women and girls, as we collect their thoughts and their insights in terms of what's working and what is not working, what potentially is causing um, safety and GBV gender-related risk. Uh, we're also looking at the area of uh, participation by women's led and women's rights organization. So we have recently uh, just wrapping up a research to really understand what the barriers um, are in terms of, well, actually enablers and barriers in terms of um, women rights groups or organizations, mm -hmm. as well as women led groups to get, engage in WASH coordination. Um, we know that our platforms need to be more diversified and we're really trying to understand why that's not happening on the ground in terms of accessing um, coordination platforms. And we really see that working with these, gro these groups is really crucial crucial to helping us to better inform the way that we mitigate the GBV risk on the ground. So it gives us that really insight in terms of the knowledge around the risk, the needs, and the preferences of women and girls in different countries in different contexts and crisis. So the research right now is uh, wrapping up and we're in the process of kind of looking at the, the actions that we'll be asking for collective action and responsibility, um, both from coordination teams as well as partners on the ground and globally, and also from other global uh, clusters. So I definitely think that's an area that we can continue to work on together. One of the other areas that we have uh, ongoing is a work stream around 
the wash severity classification where we're looking on including an, a, a module that would take in GBV and gender. So it's really looking at data sets and data points that would help to really inform um, the needs as well as those at risk. So I think that's kind of an ongoing piece of work. We're really trying to use and access data and see how different uh, data sets overlay to each other to understand the level of, of risk and vulnerability. And maybe one of the last is that we've brought on board, um, thanks to the generous support of NORCAP and NRC, a people-centered programming coordinator who works directly with the field. Uh, she's an expert uh, in the field of GBV gender, but also has brought in out her expertise to cover other cross-cutting themes. Um, so she's been working very much uh, with countries uh, such as Ukraine and Yemen with recent deployments to really help to activate gender and inclusion working groups, as well as to provide capacity building for partners in this area. So I think it's that investment in the human resource that can really ensure that at the country level, our platforms are well informed and also that partners have access to what they need to really broaden the scope of engagement and participation um, beyond just from what we can do on, on this important topic. And then lastly, in terms of collaboration, um, we're here today, I think is a, a big step. I know that we have over the years really been a supporter of uh, the 16 days of activism and also these type of events. Um, so we've had different types of collaboration going on uh, across the board. Some examples from South Sudan with the GBV AOR, really looking at um, how we can implement joint GBV risk assessments mm -hmm. um, of wash facilities, particularly that of boreholes and latrines, um, and also really consulting girls and women on how we set up these facilities and how we're really thinking about the safety aspects and how we can also um, pool funds for WASH to ensure that these type of risk assessments are ongoing. Um, Yemen, we've been working with education and the CPAOR to create a checklist for WASH in schools that really looks at safety and um, privacy, particularly for school age girls. So we're also looking at how that can take uh, bring us to have entry points into increasing accessibility and also does link to work on uh, menstrual hygiene management. And that also is something that we've been looking at in Ukraine, where we We've created mm -hmm. a tip sheet um, for oh, collective centers on MAH and also working closely with the global um, MHM working group. And lastly, I would say we're really trying to, from a global level, um, put forward a piece of work around the safety and accessibility audits. So we do review, similar to the shelter cluster on a yearly basis, the HNO and HRPs from a GBV uh, gender point of view. And we've really understood that we needed to develop a practical toolkit to support the field in terms of accessing, well, first identifying, but also assessing the GBV risk in wash facilities. So it's something that we've been working on. It also includes disability um, inclusion and we've been actually fortunate in the recent mission to Yemen by our people-centered uh, programming coordinator to test it, field test it, ground truth it, and actually roll it out. So I think there's a variety of different things that we're doing across there, our commitment to the collective responsibility, also the engagement participation of bringing more women and girls on board in the way that we mitigate GBV and gender risk, and then lastly, how we work with all of you to bring across these collaborative approaches. So thanks, that's all for me, over. Thank you, Monica. And now uh, over to Linda Dole, the, the Global Health Cluster Coordinator. Over to you, Linda. Thanks, Astrid, and greetings to colleagues online. So um, I'll keep it fairly brief because time's advancing. Yeah. Um, so at the risk of repeating actually what colleagues have said in advance me, I think the one thing to state is from the outset, of course, that um, the causes of health crises, and that includes GBV, are multidimensional. And therefore, the response to GBV and other health crises requires a multi-sectoral response. It can never be just a response solely by the health sector. That said, the health sector and the health cluster has a, a kind of crucial role to play both in the prevention and response of GBV and obviously the provision of clinical care for rape and intimate partner violence is a minimum service standard that we must commit to. Um, and we recognise as well in many of the contexts that, that we work in that often the health providers, the health facility and the health provider is the first point of contact that a GBV survivor may have in a particular setting. So it's beholden therefore that we as a, as a health cluster are fit for purpose, that we're able to provide the services 
um, uh, for immediate uh, assistance, but also that in our work that we we emphasise that multi-sectorial um, response. And to do that, I think that comes down right from the beginning is identifying the risk in the first place. So certainly as part of our public health situational analysis that we undertake, looking at GBV specifically within that, um, sharing that data, particularly with uh, protection cluster and others, looking at the, the overlay of risk from different, um, from different perspectives and identifying the different strategies then of how we uh, support that. We obviously need to ensure that the appropriate survivor-centred services are available, um, that those services are accessible and can be provided in a manner which is, one, accessible, safe and accessible for both provider and uh, the survivor themselves that's um, uh, accessing those services. For that to happen, obviously, we have to work with communities themselves. So that whole issue of community engagement and for um, women and girls, but also, I have to say, men, understanding that there may be different, you know, different population groups are at risk, that they know what their rights are in terms of being protected, how to be safe and how and when they can access health services. So there's a significant part of community engagement to be done there. Obviously, the issue then is around that the service being provided should be of appropriate quality. Colleagues ahead of me have already said that, and that service is provided in a way that does no harm to the individual. And I think taking the an example of Cox Bazaar only just pre-COVID, where there was um, substantial GBV services being provided, but when we actually drilled down looking at the quality of those services, there was some um, significant gaps in in care provision. So we've worked very strongly with uh, both health partners and others to improve both the, um, the siting of those services, how, how they can be safely accessed, and the, the competency of providers offering those services in a way that is non-discriminatory and non-stigmatizing for the uh, GBV survivor. Um, as I think Monica and Ella have both said, understanding of barriers to for survivors to access services, which are multiple, are multiple. I think COVID-19 really acted as a lens to magnify the range of those barriers. So it's not just about not being near to a facility. It's also not having having to make choices about how the um, survivors use the resources they have. Do they spend it on their health services or for themselves, or do they spend on food for their family? Uh, do, they, uh, do they have transport? Is there a clear referral link, et cetera? So these are, these are multiple elements, which unless we sit together and share our mutual understanding of the risks and the mitigation approaches, um, we never quite provide a, a, a full service. I'm happy to say as the other, as co other colleagues have is that we have, managed to provide um, investment and move this dialogue and action forward. Over the last four years, we've been lucky through BPRM uh, funding to be working with our WHO colleagues in the Sexual Reproductive Health uh, Department to really um, strengthen our gender-based violence programming. And we've done that in sort of through three ways. One is around generally acknowledging and strengthening their enhancing their accountability both within WHO and the health cluster to prioritize GBV within our as part of an integrated part of any um, response um, to strengthen the, the capacity of health cluster partners and the coordination teams to really understand their role in um, GBV mitigation and response so not just in terms of the health sector role but their role in that inter cluster dialogue, which has definitely improved. I think there's still a long way to go. There's conversations yet to be had, but we can see connections happening that didn't happen several years ago. And the obvious ones are with the GBV AOR, our linkages for the MHPSS uh, working groups in country, uh, the protection cluster, not just GBV, but also child protection, We're definitely strengthening our engagement there, but also with shelter and CCPM clusters. So the degree to which we're engaging with these entities, of course, is highly variable across the clusters, but the, the groundwork is there. That's been enhanced by really, as I think uh, Monica, you stated, is about getting capacity in country, having the HR expertise and capacity in country. So in some clusters, we have uh, GBV expertise embedded within the health cluster. In other areas, we have the expertise at regional level, which works not just with the health cluster, but also particularly with protection cluster and others 
to, to bring that collective dialogue together and to come up with um, help defining sort of joint strategies and work plans to deliver uh, services in an integrated manner at um, country level. Of course, the work is beyond what we do in the clusters, and it's also how we work, particularly with the Ministry of Health, um, but other ministries across that, so with where necessary, Ministry of Education and others, and to um, reiterate the message and support um, national authorities in strengthening their commitment to both identify the risk and respond appropriately. And I think Ukraine has been um, quite an interesting example where it is just not a subject that they have been particularly aware of or recognised. And um, so there's been some quite challenging efforts to get the to get GBV on the agenda. But again, by taking kind of multi pronged approach to that through uh, multiple sectors working together, that conversation is moving forward. And again, by investing and deploying expertise in country. I think the one of the key things really that we need to do, and um, it's in some ways should be the simplest element, but it's often proves to be the most difficult, is sharing our information, regularly sharing our information between our respective um, clusters. Uh, not just on every time we go and do a, a sort of a rapid health assessment, but even just participating more effectively in our respective meetings, that we have a presence in each of our meetings and discuss, but also at the intercluster coordination uh, that group that we have more collective discussions. The representation of those discussions absolutely do not, does not have to be international staff. These can be members, and this is where we see um, in a number of clusters where our, our uh, national and local partners really play a strong role in enhancing the dialogue and representing the issues of affected uh, community in this subject area. So much is being done, but there is much more to do, as always, and we look forward to continuing the collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. And it's true, the health cluster has a special role, right, in, in actually providing uh, clinical management of RAFE and the health the health part of, of the GBV response. So you have that big responsibility, as well as all the risk mitigation and the prevention. And so it, it's, a, it's a special cluster in that sense, in our multi-sectoral um i wish <laughs> yes so with that over to thank you so much linda and over to you one thank you astrid um i think uh, for cccm cluster and like many other clusters we've definitely benefited um from having dedicated capacity and and resourcing um, being part of the Save from the Start initiatives. So to have capacity within the cluster to engage um, and work on and you know, focus our effort in this aspect has been really valuable over the past um, seven or eight years. Um, and then I think where we started from is initially to make sure that we can have that common language to work with um, specialized actors. So uh, we, we worked quite a lot uh, with um, GBV AOR as well as um, GBV guidelines um, so that we can both contribute to each other's, um, you know, start trying to set up like ways of working, making sure that our guidelines, our training materials um, are in line towards, uh, you know, the effort to prevent and mitigate risks um, within our own operational um, capacities. Um, and, and I think within the core responsibilities of, I'm sorry, my, my cat is um, about to <laughs> go on a... <laughs> no, that's not a working from home, because I guess it will be your cat to the office. <laughs> so please ignore any noise you hear in the background, just she'll be fine. Um, some of the core responsibilities of CCCM cluster is around ensuring inclusive um, participation and representation of displaced population. Um, and I think uh, we have focused a lot on moving that from just being on paper, ticking a box, you know, how many women participated in the committee um, to try and better understand how this can be more meaningfully done. Um, so we have a number of, uh, with, so we have a participation working group within our global cluster. Uh, there are a lot of great initiatives um, and tools that have come out from it. I think Kimya is gonna help us share with us 
um, some of these tools um, that include things around women participation, um, community engagement toolkit, um, as well as the community of practice that also reach out beyond just the CCCM partners as well. Uh, of course, um, I think, sorry, um, we have definitely seen a lot of change, I think, in the, the women's group, women committees we work with, as well as our own like our female staff um, that work in, in the camps in terms of ability, you know, confidence to step up and take on leadership, take on initiative. I think Linda mentioned COVID, and I think we've definitely seen that a lot also in the women's group and women committees we work with. The fact that they take initiative and come to us with like, we would like to do this. We think these mm -hmm. are the way we can approach, um, you know, and address some of the problems we're facing. Um, and the same time that we have limited access and challenges in, in actually being there in, in person. Of course, we work uh, naturally with a lot of um, the different stakeholders and other clusters. Um, we have obviously ongoing collaboration with GBVAOR, but I think also a lot of efforts to work uh, and coordinate with WASH cluster, shelter, um, child protection, education, HLP. And we always make sure that these kind of risk mitigation measures are considered as a main part in our um, engagement. Um, there are things like doing um, a site safety audit um, together, looking at access to services. Um, and I think also like obviously being the kind of the day-to-day -day, um, team that makes sure that referral uh, are taking place, that uh, we are linking up people who come in with complaint and feedback on specific services and needs and priorities, but they also have access to, to information as well as to services um, that they need. We are definitely hoping that we can increase our effort more also in the, on the side of preparedness. I think definitely engaging the ability to engage more meaningfully and in a, a strong partnership needs to be formed during um, preparedness as well uh, in working more with local organizations. Um, we have our cluster like in South Sudan, who's been working with a lot of women organizations in also engaging them into the, the coordination platform um, and making sure that uh, the different partners are also talking the same language when it comes to uh, prevention and mitigation. Of course, I think, um, I think it's great that we're able to get all of us, all the different clusters together um, to talk about the different efforts. Um, and, and I think the last time we did a joint kind of stock taking workshop um, around this was back in 2019. So maybe having this webinar is a great opportunity to maybe also propose to others that maybe we can, this is something that we can look forward to in, in the next year or the coming years. Um, I think of course our big challenge of having camp managers is that GBV remain one of the lowest funding sector in the humanitarian responses. And I think there's there's so much we can do, but I think we can also help and chip in and advocate also for more dedicated funding for, for GBV sector um, so that you know the work we contribute and, and put into doesn't quite go uh, nowhere. Um, and I'm going to stop there, I think. Thank you very much, Astrid. Thank you to all four female global coordinators today. Um, I very much enjoyed your contribution, and I just want to maybe highlight a couple of things that would, where that cat is amazing. Uh, a couple of the threads that came throughout, and then we'll we'll have questions and answers. I. So what I heard kind of from all of you was this need to think of GBV and knowing that it's happening, whether it's conflict, health crisis, whether it's a cli related to cl climate change, and that is something that we need to deal with in terms of risk mitigation from the outset or even maybe preparedness in terms of crisis. Um, and, and that our the, the need for us to come together across, you know, within clusters, across clusters, between everyone having a responsibility and thinking about what it means and what we can do at our own levels. 
um, and that that includes, like Linda said, sharing of information, sharing of analysis, uh, really exchanging and collaboration. And then I think all of you also raised the, you know, the need for us to to contextualize and to bring in and, and ensure that we actually collaborate with communities to understand what are the risks, how can we address those risks or reduce the risk in a way that doesn't increase harm, even in the way that we try to deal with GBV, I'm thinking of one of the questions that's coming around it's sensitive, there's taboo, there's stigma, politically sensitive issues, how do you then manage to deal with it and reduce risks? Um, and I heard quite a lot about, you know, the practicals, trying to make it practical, tip sheets, having the discussions, making it, yeah, the, the practical steps that are possible. Uh, and then having those standard tools, but also contextualizing. But I'm looking at time and it's always the same when we have people together who like and are passionate about what they do. Um, so I'd like to hand over for questions. And I know there were two questions in the chat. The first is from Gabriel Mathieu, who is mentioning how GBV is sensitive, um, can be politically sensitive. So what are the ways that we can address GBV? Um, I'll read the question so that I don't misrepresent. So my question would be, do we have some guidance on how to address or to have some specific activities in a country where you can't really talk about GBV? Um, I'm looking at you on, at my screen, panelists. Uh, if one of you would like to go and try to respond, give me a, a sign. Linda? So Linda. Thanks. So I'm just going to give the example of Yemen, where um, uh, some of the, the work that we've been doing over the past couple of years was actually uh, we did in Cox Bazar, D Eastern DRC in Yemen. And I think from the initial perspective, we thought oh, this is actually Yemen. There you go. Um, we actually thought Yemen might be the most difficult um, country to bring this work forward for obvious reasons on some of the conservatism and everything in country. And actually, it was one of the countries that we made the biggest progress in. One, because it was a huge um, desire amongst the population and the service providers themselves to be able to respond to needs. So within the community and the service providers already a recognition of the need and a desire to assist. So in many ways, we look, we look to them to help us um, you create the conversation. Who were the key interlocutors we needed to speak to then? What language do we use? You know, so couch, you know, and couch it in um, contextually appropriate language. So, you know, when they're talking about GBV, you came, we came at it from a different, about, you know, the health of mothers. And I mean, these things get done. They've been done over years in different contexts. But I think it is about taking that initial sounding from the community themselves and the health providers themselves and finding capitalizing on in case of Yemen a real desire to move things forward and then of course we we found um, frankly champions within uh, the Ministry of Health but also the Ministry of Women who then did the hard work with the powers that be who would have stopped us so we had to use a different approach in the north and the south but we were quite surprised about what we could achieve there. Um, and actually we had a much harder job in Eastern DRC. And that was really, I think, almost because the level of violence in DRC was just so high in a population who almost found it very difficult to discuss the issue. So I think it's doing a very, very good and uh, detailed baseline work and listening work to begin with, and then working within a culturally appropriate language and not necessarily using who you think might be the appropriate, who you might think are the obvious mm. gatekeepers going diagonally into where that conversation needs to be held. And then getting the permissions and including key gatekeepers in the, in the workshops and everything themselves. Thanks. I think that's a very good answer. Then I, I just wanted to, to add that it would it's always possible also to reach out to the GBV coordinators because they will also have had all that thinking. Maybe there's not a, a easy solution, but they will also be aware of you know what's feasible, what are the allies, and and then 
like Linda said, try to get the local staff and local communities to, to sense how to move it, yeah, how, how to move forward uh, without creating further risks. Because it's true in places like Yemen or Afghanistan, there's even um, the, the questions around the safety of those providing services, right? So that, and then I think that's why, again, it's good to come to the coordinator who can then kind of help with the referral. Um, I'm going to look at the other questions that were sent to me. So question number two, oh, it might be health, I'm not sure. So Namir Osama is asking how we can connect this with RCCE. I'm not sure what RCCE is. The question was asked while you were talking, Lina, Linda. So I don't know if it's for you or if someone else knows what RCCE is. Well, it's risk communication and community engagement. I'm kind of oh. looking at Monica because this is UNICEF's big thing. Okay. Um, but I mean, I, bad. <laughs> I, I mean, there are different approaches to that. I mean, it's a fundamental tenet of any programming, but particularly in, in health. And I mean, UNICEF have been the champions of this for years in terms of the overarching frameworks and things. Um, but again, it's listening. It's then appropriate messaging. Um, appropriate delivery of messaging. And of course, this has become very much to the fore in, in COVID, we're really understanding. And we really used it for our GBV work in COVID as well, who we were getting a lot of feedback from about people being able or not able to um, access services. There is a collective service. I don't know, Monica, if you want to talk about these things. There is a global collective service that has been developed, which gives advice on RCCE approaches and strategies, but actually at country level, there is usually what you find is within each sector, there may be RCC work going on, but really what we need to be doing is trying to bring that into a collective joint approach. But I'm going to hand over to Monica because I know you guys have been involved. Yeah, Monica. thanks. Thanks, Linda, and thanks, colleagues, for the question. So as Linda said, this is an area that our AAP teams, so the um, accountability to affected population teams, has been very much championing. Um, I will drop the link into the collective uh, service uh, website. It is a great website. There's a lot of uh, really good resources in terms of how to work better to frame messages um, globally around engagement with communities really looking at risk and it really draws off of kind of the the evolution of you know doing the type of work around um, C4D and really how do we influence uh, behaviors social behaviors but it's it's really expanded so that's there um, maybe what I could just say more specifically in terms of what that looks like for GBV is really just I think Linda you've touched upon it the integration of me messages in uh, gender equality in RCCE. Mm -hmm. That's also very important. Also just the capacity building of those community workers and volunteers that are really um, on the front lines and in touch with, you know, households and communities on a daily basis in terms of GBV and also just providing information about services that are available um, and obviously any support that's required in case that there was someone who um, is needing to, to seek those services. Um, and of course, just engaging in working groups in the country. So a lot of the countries where we do have activated clusters, there are RCCE working groups. Um, I think one of the things that specifically WASH we're doing with RCCE is just also trying to use that as an entry point to make sure, and going back to Ella's point, the facilities and services are provided with you know the utmost um, accessibility as well as safety. So also using kind of RCCE as an opportunity to hear back Back from the end users to ensure that um, th they aren't creating more risk or they aren't in locations or you know falling into a, a situation where particularly women and girls that would be accessing those um, may may be at, at further risk so those are just a few top line I think Ella you want to come in so over to you thanks no, I just wanted to uh, add that, um, I mean, um, and, and the question, uh, thank you for that. It actually made me realize that maybe we're not really as clusters uh, um, capitalizing on the um, collective service um, because uh, it is also um, co-hosted by my agency, IFRC, and then we uh, we are in close uh, uh, contact with them and, of course, our colleagues from uh, community engagement mm -hmm. for our programming. but. Through this question, I was thinking it's an ISG structure, and maybe we have not really pulled them uh, sufficiently into our uh, global um, coordinators group. 
and that could be an action point uh, that we uh, take uh, for uh, for the next meeting or for um, next year. I think uh, that um, that could be very useful uh, for all of us. I remember that when they were first set up um, during COVID, we had had information sessions from them, but that had not really maybe led to a very um, close collaboration as clusters. So that's a that's a mental note uh, for us. Uh, thanks uh, for the colleague who uh, raised the question. Over. Thank you, Ella. Um, I'm looking at the time. One, would you like to come in with a, a quick? Yeah, I I was thinking I can address some a couple of the questions in in the chat as well. I think there was a question um, about referral. referral. Yeah. Um, and because normally when we have account managers in place, there's usually it, this is usually accompanied by some form of complaint feedback mechanism, um, which then you know means a, a referral. Um, following that, and and I think this is not always straightforward or or easy or available. Um, I think first is making sure that our staff knows what services. I, I was just about to, but one of the challenge we have is that what happens when there's no GBV actors in the area, or what happens if you're you know walking around your account managers and someone come and disclose um, a GBV incident to you. So I think for us is making sure that all the staff know. Um, what to do in, in those situations. Um, and I think often some challenges we have from CCM side is that sometimes different clusters require different forms and different information for referral. Um, so, so I think this is in some context, we are working to try and like, can we all live off, you know, having the same referral form that goes from the camp manager to different um, actors or sector. So this usually we encourage, you know, if people can resolve or find resources and capacity within the camp. So from already from health actor or wash actor, for example, they, they sort that out there and then. If this doesn't happen or there's no one available, we start to approach other clusters effectively to see if there's capacity somewhere else. Um, and so, and, and I think, of course, what we do also is, I mean, you know, the question on RCCE is that, uh, you know, we also provide information, right? It's like we have a desk and whoever walks up to. So it's also our responsibility to make sure that we continue to get updated information. What is the latest? What is the practice? Um, I think we worked a little bit harder on it uh, at the start of COVID, obviously, at the same time. Um, and, and I think, we, I hope that we can continue to, to keep up the, the convention as well. And just lastly, there was a question about, you know, how we deal with some of the barrier that is, uh, you know, like cultural norm um, and practices. And I think this comes up, uh, we've definitely realize and highlight the fact that you need to engage men and boys as well in a lot of our effort. So even though it might not be addressing directly um, the, the GBV incidents or, or the, the reporting, but you know, as part of our normal programming. So I think Linda was mentioning, you know, how do you do that listening, you know, understanding what is happening what are the boundaries that are we're working with and and i think to hear also from the women what they feel comfortable um engaging in and and how they would like us to to support them thanks astrid thanks one no it's it's true it's important not to seek out or when, when you have people women and girls coming and reporting uh gbv it is important to to well, in a way, those discussions should only happen when you already know there are GBV services in place, right? And 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 the role, the major role of the GBV subcluster, uh, although it's not perfect in every context, there's a lack of funding and capacity, but it is to have that referral pathway. So from our side, we would like to 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 to, to see that if we are talking about survivors of GBV, that they are referred to the to the to the GBV subcluster, so that there can be a case management and a, and, a, and a care around for the person, right? Um, I, I was told to be very strict about time because everyone else has an important meeting afterwards, so we believe you do. So we have one more minute left. Um, 
I would like to say a huge, huge thank you. And then maybe go back to what Ella was saying in the beginning that, you know, ideally we want to prevent violence. We want to mitigate the risks of violence and not kind of come with a GBV response. In um, The GBV AOR sits where it is the GBV response of providing care, that's our role. It is also our role to, to provide technical capacity to other clusters and sectors in terms of risk mitigation. So while the accountability is on everyone, we recognize that sometimes we need to contribute in terms of our time and technical capacity and advice as well. And uh, I think what's also very clear from, from this call, which is very, very encouraging, is that over the past couple of years, the, the global clusters have invested much, much more in having GBV technical expertise ready to support uh, field subclusters. So on that note, it is three o'clock. I think, thank you so much for, for joining. I wish we had had more time for questions and answers. It's always the same. We start off kind of formally and now we would all be ready to talk for longer. But it was a pleasure to, yeah, to have everyone here today. And again, a big thank you to um, our four global cluster coordinators for pulling this together. And if you're interested, there's also the global uh, cluster statement for the 16 days of violence that is online. So thanks everyone. Thank you so much Astrid for having us and hosting us. Thank and you. And keeping Thank us on time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Thank I'm you, being like the, the tough person. But it's nice to see you all. And the cat didn't want to go longer either. I, yeah, no. <laughs> she recognizes when everyone say thank you. And then, uh, <laughs> it's like time. I think the last thing that it keeps coming up when we have these discussions as well about collective responsibilities, the this sense which came up very strongly in the meeting where one and I was yesterday as well, mm. the day before, is this sense that It is actually about engaging all communities and all women and girls and minority groups and people living mm. with disabilities and all the different sectors. It's huge. And we have mm. to go on and continue and, and it's, do everything we can to prevent violence. But it's a huge effort in terms yeah. of there's no one that's not concerned. You have the police yeah. and, you know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I think uh, Monica Pam was there from UNICEF mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. as well. And we were talking also you know that i felt a bit like you know we need more like the mitigation buddies mm -hmm. you know i feel like i mm -hmm. there was we had we're supposed to have a focus group discussion about mitigation and i think mm -hmm. everyone just want to talk about actually like specialized you know perpetrator uh, you yeah, know like exactly. the, and and then i feel like maybe it's uh yeah we can we can talk more about the you know the, but we need yeah. all sides and i think that's what's tricky right you need to have the services and the response so that you can provide life-saving support when violence happens. And we know it mm. always happens in mm -hmm. every society, right? Mm -hmm. Although it's increases in humanitarian, we do need to ensure we do the risk mitigation and the prevention. And the prevention also involves, mm. you know, development actors. But it's true that the prevention and risk mitigation is also around engaging, you know, local police in terms of who are in contact when people refer if there are serious cases of sexual violence. Yeah, it's it's, it's yeah. huge. So we just have to hammer on and continue. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Right. I think, yeah, next year for the say from the start, we normally host like a kind of partners um, picnic. Maybe we can extend to other global clusters mm. as well. Astrid, mm -hmm. what do you think? No. I agree because I th I think what's what's what we're we're the least good at in the GBV community is kind of branching out and just having mm -hmm. less technical discussions about what we're all trying to do in a way mm -hmm. you know like practically and 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 be inclusive about it would be great yes one well, yeah no let's do it <laughs> cool thank you so much and it's Thanks. so great to be on a panel with all of you good to see you take thank care thank you bye 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 bye, -bye. bye, -bye.